You are listening to Nerd Best Friends, a podcast that covers the nerdy conversations you're already having, or wish you could. It's the nerdiest thing you'll do this week. Welcome back to another episode of Nerd Best Friends. I am Annalise, and I'm here with my best friend, Rob. Hey, it's me, Rob, your best friend, your super nerd, and your podcast host. Nerd Best Friends can be found wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe and follow us now. If you would like to support our podcast, subscribe to Nerd Best Friends on Patreon for as little as $1 a month. If you'd like to give a one-time donation, find us at Nerd Best Friends on Venmo. This is episode 45, and today we nerd out over one of the most popular shows of the late 80s and early 90s, Quantum Leap. Oh boy. But first, what I like about it. For this episode's why I like what I like about it, it will be no surprise. But I'm going to take a different a different approach to it. Okay, it's painting miniatures. But <laughs> <laughs> here's okay, all right. I'm gonna here's what I like about it. No, 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 okay. no. Here's what I like about it. Maybe I'll change it to YouTube miniature painting channels because okay. what I like about it is there's so many different ways to do it that it keeps staying fresh and staying fun for me. So for instance, when you get like an army painter starter set, it's going to come with the pamphlet with, you know, with like the dip method, say was their old, right, uh, yeah. their old thing, block in your base colors, dunk it in some like lacquer, it shades everything in there, flick it off. That's a way to go to get things done quickly. There's the speed paint method where you prime something bright white and you put bright colors on it, block those in and the speed paint kind of takes care of the shading and stuff for you. There there's the Zenithal touch to that, or there's the slap chop that we've been doing yes. uh, under those transparent paints as well. Then there's like the traditional triad painting where like, okay, you're going to put the darkest blue on the pants, then you're going to highlight it with the medium blue, then you're going to like give it a little edge highlight of the lightest blue and build up your colors that way. There's ways where you take the different, uh, you block in the colors and then you use different colored inks to ink each blocked color to bring the depth and things like that. There's the dry brush techniques where you do where all you do is dry brush and you kind of layer up in those tracks. There's just a lot of techniques and there are a ton of different YouTube channels out there that'll do tutorials and, and, and highlight these different styles. So it's like when you look at a model and you're like, okay, well, I want to do this the same way that I always kind of do things or maybe I'll try something else. You know, this model would look good dry brush because it's got a lot of like funky things. This model will look good with speed paints because it's got a lot of like it should be bright in colors. This is a big old tank or a, you know, know something i'm gonna do just like a stippling dry brush but there's just so much out there that it kind of it can keep fresh and if you ever feel like stuck in a rut or i'm just using the same colors and the same paints over and over and over again there's another technique for you out there so i'm gonna say it. what i like about it is miniature painting youtube channels that highlight different miniature painting techniques <laughs> that's what i like about it <laughs> would you say that would you say that you have used a lot uh, like changed your techniques based off watching these or does it just help inform well let me let me back up a second I would watch those and see oh that's why my mini I painted this way turned out like this now I understand that better I'm gonna change the order or so on and so forth because I'm not someone as deep into the mini painting as you so like I'm not gonna buy more paints I'm not gonna see the way someone did something and try a new way I'm sticking with the st speed paints and the slap chop but watching some of those is like oh because I put this color on this speed paint on before this speed paint or I did the pants before I did the shirt like I can see that but have you actually changed your techniques based off of YouTube channels? 100% and I've gone through different phases um, with that because I guess because I've probably been painting for so long I've probably been painting over over 20 years yeah. and so started with the games workshop way or whatever which is kind of using those tracks, right block out your colors highlight with the medium color edge highlight with the lightest color type thing then I discovered the army builder way Way, like that dip method it was like cool i'm gonna block out colors then i'm gonna just give it that all over shade or dunk it yeah. then i evolved from there when i saw like oh wait there's all these like different color shades so now when i block my colors i'm gonna shade over them with the same color shade to like, do it that way and then the speed paints the contrast paints came out so it was like okay we're gonna use bright colors and we're gonna 
do the white undercoat and stuff. And I was like, oh, I could get shadows if I did a Zenithal. And then I saw the slap shop method. Yeah. And like, okay, okay, cool. Let's do that. And then there's always been different like dry brush kind of techniques and stuff that I, I've used on terrain. Like I have a totally different way that I paint all the terrain and stuff. Oh, with, sure. Um, sure. Dry brushing and different kinds of paints there. So and then I'll go back to things as well. Sometimes I'll be like, you know what? I want this to look a certain way. I know that to achieve that, I'm going to have to go back to old school or, you know, kind of thing. I want this to be really bright. So I'm not going to do a slash. I'm going to do a really bright white undercoat so that the colors pop or something like that. And yes, I will buy more paints and different brushes and different <laughs> things when I see those kind of things. Army Painter just probably right before Christmas came out with their new line of pigments. They're fanatic paints where they've oh. retooled their entire line to have like way more pigments and stuff. So you don't need that idea of, oh, you'll put on two thin coats. It's like, nope, one coat and we'll do it. We've they apparently they've invented some new medium to mix with their pigments so they can put like a zillion trillion pigments in there, but still make it creamy and smooth. And you don't have like wow. so we'll see. Like I will definitely test those, right? I'll yeah. be like, oh right. cool. So there's something new in the industry, something new in that hobby space. I want it and I want to try yeah. it and I want to see what it can do and where it'll fit into my hobby and Enjoyment time. Right on. We have three new subscribers to our Patreon, Rob. So I want to give a shout out to Adam, Carolee, and Cassandra. Thank you for jumping out on our more nerds level on our Patreon. Nerd mail. A shout out to Kathleen, who found our marching band episode and the bonus content and shared it across her social medias. So I want to say thank you to Kathleen and Fight On. That marching band experience it just resounded with a lot of people. We've had an uptick after that episode on all of our social medias. So to all of our new listeners, thank you and keep listening. Even though we're not going to talk about marching band all the time, it's always there. Maybe coming. we should. <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah, maybe we should just talk about marching band all the time. Um, we'll do a test. We'll, eat, we'll, we'll do an episode where we bring back Adam and we'll do an episode where we talk more about marching band and we'll see if one of those which factors one was more, yes. is the bump. I think that's a that's a good experiment to have on the podcast. But uh, thank you to Kathleen. And that is the best gift that you can give to Rob and myself is to share our uh, link to our podcast and ha ask people to subscribe and follow. So thank you in advance for everyone who will do that for us. And happy holidays. Happy holidays. Now to the episode. We're going to talk about one of Rob's favorite shows of it all time. It really is one of my favorite shows. Okay. <laughs> so we were, <laughs> this is, this is funny. We were supposed to record or I thought we were supposed to record yesterday. And yeah. I had gotten home like really late the, the day before after doing some traveling. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I got to get ready for this quantum leap episode. I stayed up till two in the morning watching quantum leap <laughs> on Friday night. And now it's Sunday morning, but I'm still jazzed about it. It was not a chore at all. Uh, what I realized was I probably have seen, I mean, I've seen Quantum Leap all the way through probably four or five times throughout my life, but wow. it had been, it had been a long time. And yeah. I'm like, God, I love this show. <laughs> so well, you know, good. it's funny. I, I don't know that I've ever seen an entire season in order. I know my parents watched this. My parents did not watch a lot of television. They watched movies from time to time. I know a lot of my pop culture comes from both adolescent survival, like, I wanted to know what all the people were talking, all our friends were talking about in class the next day in order to like mm -hmm. be part of the crowd. But my parents would see movies, but not a lot of television shows. I remember this one and I remember them watching 21 Jump Street, but I think my mom had a crush on like young Johnny Depp. She used to have a poster <laughs> of him on her wall. So this was one that they allowed us to sit and watch with them. And you know, the more I think about it, I think my parents were big old nerds and just they grew up at a time that it wasn't cool to be a nerd. So they would sure. have never admitted it. But like a, a <laughs> sci-fi type show like this, I would have never thought my parents would watch something like that, but they did. And that's what I remember. So I don't know that I've seen every episode. I don't, I know I've not seen an entire season in order. Um, Interesting. But I remember loving the show. So that's the opposite of my experience. I we did not watch the show uh, okay. as it was coming out. I discovered the show I think when I was in high school, and this was when everybody and anybody wanted to have a cable channel. So it was kind of the beginning of that time when there were like 130 channels, and so people would just show reruns of old shows. Oh yeah, the whole syndicate channels. market. Yeah. Yes, and so I. I think I watched Quantum Leap. I want to say there was a time where I was really sick and 
and I had uh, like the little TV in my room and probably put it on some channel and it was a quantum leap marathon. And so mm. I've only really seen it in order back to back where like he leaps into the person at the end and then the show starts again and he's left the into next that episode person right and away. just keeps going, which I yeah. think is a really fun way to to watch it it helps with that idea of like what a grind this dude is on because there's never it's always something new something new and a new place and a new face just an absolutely cool thing and then they would do that a lot i remember seeing it that way probably three times just like oh it's christmas time i'm on break i'm hanging out bored or the weather's bad oh look quantum leaps on for the next (laughs) 72 hours (laughs) just catch this huge swath and this huge chunk of episodes and of course i have have my DVD box Heck sets yes. of Heck all yes. five seasons, which that was fun. That was a fun way to watch it now. I was surprised to see that it wasn't streaming on any of the services that I have. So like, wait a minute. No, no, no. <laughs> Past Rob did me a solid and I dug into the back <laughs> of the uh, media cabinet and I found my old DVDs, which you could tell like that all of the boxes, it's a box set, but they're yeah. all different in some way. So season one has like eight discs in it and there's a bunch of trivia. Like it's got interviews with Scott Bakula oh, before yeah. each episode. All like, yeah. the thing I remember about this episode is or the mirror part, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, oh, cool. I'm going to learn stuff. Season two. Nope. Totally different. It's like <laughs> just a totally different menu, whatever. The third one was like, oh, now we figured out how to record on both sides of a disc. So there's only right. like four discs in that box right. because right. they're double sided. And then in the next season, they started putting commercials in it for like other shows and stuff. Like, what the hell is this? You know, it, it was a lost art when DVDs and Blu rays started to go to the wayside. Some of my favorite things I still have on DVD or Blu ray because they have the ones you can watch where they're doing commentary over an episode or over a movie that has like the director or the writer or the yeah. actor. And yeah, I mean, that's a that's a lost art in this stream streaming world because you don't really get that anymore no but it is definitely cool and it's it serves a lot for the kind of stuff that we do that would be very handy to have and i'm sure we could probably find it for most things but it's not just the way anymore although i don't get the experience a lot i don't usually stream things and watch them on my computer i'm usually like putting it on the apple tv to like Mm -hmm. the big screen or whatever but if you're using services like netflix or like especially amazon prime and you're watching things on your computer like when you pause it an overlay will come up with yes. like their names or trivia things or click here for more info and that's a different and, watching experience as well and some of them are so detailed like who is in this scene instead uh-huh. of like just who's in this movie or who's in this like who is in this scene right now and it'll show you the right. actors and then you can click on those yeah there there is a little interactive experience with that you're right so for a show that i love and like i know a lot about like a quantum leap That would be the next level would be to see, oh, this is this actor. This is that actor. And that happens anyway. As time goes by and we're watching these episodes, it's like, oh, hey, that's that guy. Oh, Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I noticed there's like a young Terry Hatcher in the first season. There's so many actors and actresses that were not yet who they were in the late 80s. What's the guy with the voice? He was putty on Seinfeld. I didn't watch Seinfeld. I thought I think Jerry Seinfeld was annoying. It's always on the tip of my tongue. (laughs) He's got the voice. Patrick Warburton. Yeah, I don't even know who that is. Patrick Warburton with the voice. He was there. He was in that Vietnam episode that we watched as like a super young kid. I was like I know who you're talking about. I didn't know his name. Well, let's talk about Quantum Leap itself for those who may not be familiar. So on our notes, the first question is, what is Quantum Leap? And I... I answered it very simply. I just said it's a nerdy science. It's a nerdy science way of looking at our recent past and human nature. But you did something extra. Theorizing that one could time travel within their own lifetime, Dr. Sam Beckett stepped into the Quantum Leap accelerator and vanished. He awoke to find himself trapped in the past facing mere images that were not his own and driven by an unknown force to change history for the better. His only guide on this journey is Al, an observer from his own time who appears in the form of a hologram that only Sam can see or hear. And so Dr. Beckett finds himself leaping from life to life, striving to put right what once went wrong and hoping each time that his next leap will be the leap home. So I was going to try to do that. I wrote, I read that. But I was going to try to do it by heart, and I probably could. (laughs) 
I imagine you would be able to. That is so, how each episode starts. And it is just that. So uh, it, although I did notice in season one, it was a little bit longer. And they put in a thing at the beginning of like about to lose funding for his time travel yeah. experiment or something like that. He decided yeah. to rush it and go in and. So there was kind There's, of that, that trope season, of the accident, right? Yeah. And season one also has a few where he's doing it in first person. It's not the the female voice. There's a couple where oh. like, I'm Sam Beckett and blah, 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 blah. And then I, to me, it, like some of those reminded me of Firefly, how Firefly was starting to try to get its footing by changing that opening. And also because- That's right. It's like, oh, you probably heard about this new show. Let right. us catch you up. Kind of thing. And also, um, Sean in that episode about Firefly said that the studio aired them out of order and that mm-hmm. required them to change that intro to match what was going on because we could watch them in order, but they didn't air in that order or something like that. So that's what it reminded me of. It changed just a little bit from that first pilot episode into the rest and then i read something and i didn't go back and look but somewhere in the fourth season i think Mm -hmm. there was something that said there's an episode where the beginning was changed and it stayed that way for the rest of the series i don't know what was changed. i think that's episode four i feel like there was a big difference where like the theme song changed to have like more drums and stuff in it the voice became much more dramatic it might have even changed the female voice because from then on when they started as the show goes on and they run out of ideas they'll like go back to the far future of 1999 uh, more often and it's like oh the voice from the voiceover is the voice of the computer like that's ziggy and like those kinds of things oh sure yeah so there was like a little bit of a tie in there but but to go back scott bacula invents not only a time machine but an artificial intelligence slash quantum computer which here in the year of our lord 2023 actually comes back around to be an amazing invention like the way that computer works which they call it ziggy the way that computer works is it look it reads a situation right it gets a prompt of what the situation is sam beckett jumped into this person and here's the history of what happened to that person and all the people in this scene and then quantum computing it goes through and it goes okay what if so it looks at history it goes okay here's all the decisions that these people made and then it makes a prompt of what if not this what if this different right and it large language model style like fills in the blanks of all of those different decisions and then comes to a conclusion that hey with an 80 percent chance of certainty if you change this scene during this day that you've jumped into xyz will happen that will be better for all of the people around you and it's like that's amazing (laughs) that's that's where we're at right now is ziggy the person no, Ziggy's they, the computer. They make reference to him as a person in the pilot. That's gushy. So <laughs> there's two people. So did you watch the last episode on our list? No. So let me let me let's okay. let's go there because we we do have a list of the what four or five episodes that we wanted to watch. So here's what happened. I don't have them on DVD. I was required to just find clips on YouTube. So mm. I spent a That's few hours watching happened. clip 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 <laughs> clip. This morning, I just did a search because I knew it wasn't on any of the like I checked the th- the the apps I the streaming apps that I yeah. subscribed to. Couldn't find it anywhere, right? Come to find out that it's on Peacock, which is the NBC mm-hmm. app, right? Mm-hmm. We don't have it. But I went back and I, I was talking to my partner, Sarah, who did at one point subscribe. And I, I went to her and I said, hey, what if I just resubscribe for like $6, watch these episodes and we'll just cancel it again? And she said, oh, we're supposed to get a new one with our cable provider. So then I spent time going through our cable provider. And sure enough, we have two years of Peacock for free. So this morning, I did all the little things to subscribe and I started watching. Watching, I watched almost all of them. I did not get to the last two to watch fully. And I'm right in between the Leap Home Parts 1 and 2. That's all I could squeeze in of full episodes. But the part of the mistake I made was I got in. I'm like, I'm going to watch the pilot too. Because the pilot's got to tell mm. us so much more. Oh gosh. Oof, the pilot is so slow. Never watch a pilot. That, no, never watch a pilot. <laughs> how did this show get picked up from that pilot? Like I could stand it <laughs> because I know all the things and it was cool to see, oh, here's the origin of this. Here's the origin of why isn't L coming in? Because first of all, L is a creep, big time creep yes, in the pilot. That's the point. <laughs> it's disgusting. 
And yeah, like they, it just is so slow. It was so bad. Remind me, is that a baseball one? Does he know baseball he, player? He's, no, he's okay. an Air Force pilot in oh, like 56 one, yes. who is trying new it. Like they're trying to get to Mach 3 without he's dying. Trying to break and the they sound barrier di- or something yes, without dying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Gosh, it's so slow. But there was, yeah, I think they weren't try. They weren't hundred percent sure how they were gonna do Ziggy. So he, even Sam, gets confused on who Ziggy is or what Ziggy is, and they don't get into the technical like percentage. There's a percentage of this, 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 mm. because they're still trying to feel that out as the pilot episode. So it was really interesting. But yeah, because of that, I've only seen bits and pieces of the last couple episodes on our list. So still explaining it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it yeah. It goes into this time thing. And so basically the the whole idea with it with the show and the rules of the show is like a string theory. Pop quiz. You know the little plastic things on the end of your shoelaces? What are yeah. those called? They have a name? They definitely have a name. The tips of your shoelaces? Yeah. That's crazy. Hold on. Let's search it. They're not appellets. Those are the things on your shoulder pads. What? Are... What? what is the name for the plastic tip of the shoelace? An aglet. Aglet. That's it. Not appellet. Wow. Aglet. Okay. So. Listen, kids. Pick your shoelace. You're it's holding almost it. Christmas. You want to impress your friends? <laughs> now you know what an aglet is. So okay, imagine continue. you got this shoelace and you're, and you're holding it, you're pinching it with your index finger and your thumb and you're holding the aglets, right? You stretch it out in a straight line. So okay. that's, that's your life. One aglet is your birth. The other aglet is your death, right? That's your, that's your timeline. That's your life. Okay. Right? So you take that shoelace and instead of stretching it out top from side to side, you wad it up and hold it like in your fist okay. and kind of like open it up. So it's all like. A big tangled mess right there, right? So the theory with Quantum Leap is that within your life, everywhere that that string touches itself, there is an opportunity. uh, There's there's a place where the timeline touches. So you should be able to leap within your own self every place where that touches. So his idea was... If he built this machine, this magical time machine, and and was able to go back and forward through time within his lifetime, but he he thought he'd be jumping into himself, right? right. Like he'd right. be like, oh, well, I'm going to go from here to here because the time space continuum touches there, right? It's or the, right. the veil between that essence of the multiverse is at its thinnest. So I'll be able to bounce back and forth from those places was the original experiment, like Got the it. original theory behind it. But what happened was he didn't jump into different points along his own shoelace. It turned out that every shoelace of every person in the world is wadded up in a ball. And so anywhere that his shoelace touched anybody else's, he could it was jump expanded to every, points. it was like six degrees of Kevin Bacon, some way, sh- shape or form, it yes. rippled to connections. And it's interesting how they build that because you get one of the episodes we watched in season two, MIA, he jumps into someone who knows Elle's first wife who remarries when Elle is missing in action from the Vietnam War. Yes. And Admiral, uh, Rear Admiral left side Albert Calavici was a prisoner of war in Vietnam. And, <laughs> his, <laughs> and his first, you know, the love of his life, his first wife, thinking that he was dead, was going through a hard time, fell in love with some dude and got remarried and uh, that's a cool episode because sam goes back to he leaps into a detective in that yeah. one and that's a fun one because rear admiral left side albert calabici sabotages the mission to try to change things for his own right. benefit and not let his first wife remarry you know meet this guy and remarry so that he will have someone to come home to when he gets right. when he gets back from vietnam which is a cool conflict for that particular episode yeah it's a real conflict that's not of interest and and they talk about how they're not there to change the course of their own lives and sam's got to figure out what he's actually there to do which is to save the life of the detective's partner and 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 it it was really interesting it humanized l obviously because he's such a sleaze for the first season Um, i think that was a course correction because i think they made him a huge sleaze ball because he's supposed to be the opposite of sam in every way yeah right so sam is a boy scout he's very smart he holds multiple doctorates and these kinds of things where al is there on that mission because he's got the street smarts or the life experience 
of right. being in different places through his career in the military. And also, I think maybe there's like military oversight in that way for the experiment. I yeah, they never quite get to it, but it, hints, it kind of hints at that a lot. Yeah. And they become good friends. But what's interesting about it, and I actually have this in the notes for later when we start talking about the characters, but them being like him being such a, a sleaze and Sam being such a boy scout, like it leads to those like conflicts and stuff, but it doesn't come across to me as super tropey as like an odd couple where it's done for comedy all the time Definitely or not. like a buddy cop movie where it's done yeah. for those kind of things like i think it's a good example of here's the smart science nerd and here's the sleazy military guy they always get the job done they figure out how to work to like they use their opposites their opposition to work together and get the job done every time rather than just for laughs. I mean, if we give the writers or the studio credit, I think they went too far with Al, that uh, he's he's not a real likable character to a female audience who was probably the driver of the show with Scott Bakula, that they had to humanize him in a little bit of a way that he wasn't just this womanizer, almost misogynist manner. He was this guy who had a wife that he loved dearly, who moved on when he was missing in action came home and she was married to another man years down the line i, I thought so there's it was a that really explanation of like way. well this is why he's that yeah. way this was the yeah. tragedy that happened but you're absolutely right i believe that there were stipulations like every season had these like scott bacula moments and definitely for that female yeah. audience scott bacula smooches somebody in every episode scott mm-hmm. bacula takes his shirt off at least once almost in every, every episode yeah. scott bacula sings <laughs> At least once in every season. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it was definitely written into the contract. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, all right. So we have Dr. Beckett, who is now leaping from person to person, and it makes for a really good ability with the the time travel rules that they throw out here. We can talk. Let's talk about that. I know we're jumping all over our our notes, but it makes sense to talk about that here. The manner in which they laid out the rules for his experiment allowed them to revisit moments in history. And I think you've said this before, we're talking about one of our decade episodes, our nerd watching episodes, you had mentioned that by way of creating the rules the way they did, they went and visited moments in American history, recent American history, in which it's not directly Selma and Martin Luther King. It's this town in Alabama that's a month before the Selma marches, or it's not directly going to save JFK's life. It's going to keep this person from going mad, which triggers some other side event. So they were smart to not directly go to the really big events, but you want to talk about shoestrings, all the different shoestrings that just intersect and intertwine with each other, bits and pieces around those histories. Absolutely brilliant by Donald P. Belisario uh, (laughs) to set those rules and to stick with them because whether we like it or not, we look at, so the, the show takes place in 1999 and I believe at that moment, Sam Beckett, Dr. Sam Beckett now, and it is important to note as a trivia fact, it is Sam Beckett, not Samuel Beckett. As Samuel Beckett is a famous poem, a uh, poet, and Sam is not short for Samuel. It's just Sam. To set those rules, because whether they really realized it or not, those 40 years between 1959 and 1999 are so jam-packed with American history and really social issues that they could tackle and go through. What really stood out to me looking through the episode list and watching the episode, especially that that last one was this was a drama first and a sci-fi show second, because they attacked so many different social ideas from gosh, mental wellness to women's rights, to the war in Vietnam, to civil rights, to to race relations, to AIDS and drug use. And the eight, like its purpose was to take us through these small moments or, or these slices of life, what it was like in this city, what it was like in this little town during this moment in time, like you said, just tangentially to the big event, right? Because if it was every episode was, oh, here's how we prevented the JFK assassination. Here's how we, you know, talked to Nixon and convinced him not to go to, like, that's a, that's not a, 
that's not a show that's based in any kind of realism or any right. kind of stakes because we right. know that that oh well you're just creating a multiverse or oh you're just you, like what is that like you can't yeah. touch those big events all the time it's those tangential events and it's people's lives living there that creates that drama and shows those time periods and such a good idea and i think i yeah like you said it's just brilliant and I will say on those rules, the time travel mechanics, I thought it was really interesting. And this also comes out of the pilot. So I don't know if it changes having not seen, probably not seen every single episode, but they have it where Al is trying to explain to Sam what's going on as he's trying to, as he's regaining his memory about why he's where he is. He says that the first person he jumps into is like named Jake or something like that. Okay. Jake switched places with him. Oh, so yes. That's something we didn't go over. They're there at like the other person is there at the the base in, the, in yeah, 1999. Project Quantum Leap. Yes. Yeah. And like telling them stuff. Which and what's is funny is they're in what, Sam's body. Yes. I thought that was really interesting. I don't know how much it's brought back, but I think that's a really cool, like you're not just taking over for that person and that person's in the ethereal. You are literally leaping and swapping places to where that other person's in the future and you're in their body. Like that's a really cool rule that you don't see existing often in time travel stories. No, most time travel, most time travel stories is about a visitor, right? You're, yeah, right. you might have some tension of being the fish out of water or trying to figure out what was going on, but you're an outsider in that timeline. In Quantum Leap, you're as inside it as you can be. You are that person. Right. And I really appreciated, you know, this could have been a completely sci-fi heavy show where it was time travel for time travel's sake. That's not the gist we get from Sam Beckett's experience. It's not just about the time travel. It's about right. the going back and repairing. It's about the Absolutely. human element. And that is that is something very important to it is it's the small stories. It's repairing small stories and relationships that lead on to better things for those people around him. I think, gosh, it's been so long, but in that pilot episode, it does even touch on that. He's not there to break the sound barrier. He's there to like hold that family together and right. deliver the baby of his wife or something like right. that. Right. Right. It often, especially early on, would have those twists where it's like, oh, clear, like this is the, this is the thing that this person is known for. So clearly the plot must revolve around that. But oftentimes there'd be a twist and it's like, no, what it's really about was this other relationship or this other yeah. thing that helped another character around the person that they leaped into much more of a human like as you said drama element right that's the old lady in the episode the color of truth was one of the episodes we saw yes. right that's saving the old lady not because her life needed to be saved it's because what she does next is invite her african-american employee to sit at a lunch counter with her in a whites only restaurant and use her power and her white privilege as the mayor's widow to make people accept change for in, in the town of rights. red dog indiana like the most yeah. little racist place you could ever yes. find like it's so actually let's let's kind of go through let's talk about that episode since that is okay. one that we both watched yeah i don't think that episode gets written today there's no way that that episode is on tv right now with a couple of white actors you know speaking truth to the civil rights movement however i think that episode is still good i think that episode holds up and is Totally fine. Well, it's palatable because they did a good job with... Scott Bakula did a good job, first of all, because it's not just... It, as you mentioned before, it's not just stories of uh, civil or racial unrest. He jumps into female characters in which mm -hmm. Scott Bakula is putting on makeup and wearing dresses and heels. And the way his character and the way he acts out, being confronted with his knowledge of male privilege and male white privilege and having to react on things when he's not treated with that male privi privilege or with that white privilege. It's viable now because of how it's approached and how he does it. Because I think you're right. I think that's, that, episode, that story would not be written. I don't know if it would be as delicately, purposefully approached now that it was then. It's just done in a manner. I actually put that in my notes, right? It's a mechanism to explore human behavior. There's actually academic papers about this and about how he it. confronts <laughs> being, being treated as a woman in the mm -hmm. 60s and how he has to reflect with that. That the, This whole episode, The Color of Truth, he said, Sitting there going, it doesn't make sense to me that I can't just take a drink of water. I am thirsty. I can't just come in and get food. I am hungry, right? Like he can't fathom the, 
the the loss of humanism and how and he approaches that. I think that's a better way to. I think it's a teaching moment as well for like the perceived audience of yeah. that, right? Like who's going yeah. to identify with Doctor Sam Beckett, the white guy watching this right. sci-fi show? And it is. It's like way ahead of its time as far as that kind of check your privilege moment. It's like, yeah. Well, I never think about where I sit down to eat lunch or what water fountain I use, but right. oh my gosh, this is what it was really like at this time. And that yeah. time wasn't really that far away if we're thinking right. about it and, and those kinds of things. And it helps us look at the situations and, and our, our fellow human beings and their experience and things. And I think it's, I was just like, when it, when I set it up, I was like, Ooh, is this going to be cringy? Is this going to be bad to have like Sam, you know, Scott Bakula playing this? black character i think it was great i think it still holds up as being really well done i thought it was culturally responsive in a manner we don't see very often in the late 80s and early 90s especially when he's in the kitchen trying to cook chitlins right and he's grossed out because he's never seen anything like it and the surprisingly having this is where what you're saying about al really rings true because he jumps into the kitchen is like, oh my gosh, it's chitlins and, and collard greens. And oh my gosh, I wish I could smell it. And, and, and so those street smarts that Al knows is what really saves him that day. But that culture of the responsive there for Sam Beckett to be like, I am grossed out by innards here. I have to cook these things because this is what this man would have done. The characters doing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it, it is moving. interesting. And I, and I want to touch back to what you were saying about the episodes where um, he leaps into women as well. The episodes we chose to watch were The Color of Truth from season one, MIA from season two, The Leap Home parts one and two from season four, The Leap Back from season four, and A Leap for Lisa from season four even though there were five seasons it seems like season four was really where it was hitting on all eight but what's well, interesting i, I want to about- say okay. that let me the, the leap home on imdb is season three so i just want to oh that must be a typo for me i think you're absolutely right. yeah it's season three and then season four starts starts with the leap back Yep, you're absolutely right. That's a typo on my part. Um, What's interesting about all of these episodes that were chosen, and I I came up with this list from uh, three or four lists I found on the internet. These episodes all revolve around the characters, Sam and Al, right? Like the first one, except for the first one. The first one, I think, is just one that's remembered as being very culturally important. It's one of the highest rated episodes. Yeah. And MIA is the one where he leaps and Al tries to change his own history. The Leap Home is where Sam jumps into himself as a himself, 16 as year a old, teenager yeah and then into a person in his brother's platoon in vietnam the leap back is the one where he leaps into Hold oh on, that's we're getting them all confused into, they do a cross leap al goes into yes, 1947 yes, 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 yes. and sam goes back and meets everybody back at the headquarters right. and then a leap for lisa is the one where he um, to al Yes, as it is a yes. as an ensign in the navy. So yes, it just happened to be that these were very like inside baseball ones, and we didn't have on our list. It's like we were talking about a few episodes ago. Like Rogue One is only so good because of all the other Star Wars movies and what you know. Right. The the Spider Man uh, comic book with him in the children's hospital is only so good because we have forty years of Spider Man. The episodes we chose to watch are only good because they're built on their own universe building from the other right. one hundred episodes. But right. where those other one hundred episodes, that's where the meat is. I agree, and I think the problem for me in watching these and skipping the others is it feels like as they get later into the series and maybe lose their footing a little bit on the writing and the popularity of it, they go in and break some of their own rules and face breaking some of their own rules about not changing the course of their individual lives for the better. So that was interesting to watch back to back, that it was all revolving around them. When my memory was really about all the dozens of other episodes I've seen about just the random one-offs in which he's helping a random thing. Yeah, if I were coming up with a list for someone who has not seen the show, it would not be this list it, it no, will probably purposely not. leave these ones off of the list because yeah, it's not yeah, yeah. really the the crux of the show but like um, season two is really strong i read a lot of the synopsis of season two and there's a lot of the episodes i recall seeing like on syndication or when my parents watched it uh season three was also really really strong and i think four and five get a little bit wonky i think when you get to five and they're really they really i think are trying in my opinion outsider's opinion they're really trying to go after the big moments in history and draw back Uh, their audience because that's when they're doing the Lee Harvey Oswalds Mm -hmm. and, you know, a lot of Vietnam and a lot of, they just, they, they go after some of the bigger things instead of these, 
carefully constructed. Like I'm looking at the season two one since you were yeah. looking at my DVD yeah. box set and looking at the, yeah. the images on the back. There's the episode where he leaps into a Jewish rabbi and has mm-hmm. conflicts like anti-Semitic conflicts there. There's the one where he leaps into a person without sight and yes. there's the conflict there. There's the one where he leaps into a person with Down syndrome and the social commentary there or how about the he, he he leaps i'm looking at episode four he leaps into a woman in the 1960s having how to having to deal with sexual harassment by her boss which, she's like a secretary yep. right yep. yep perfect that was the next one i was actually gonna say oh, so, okay <laughs> uh, i think there's another one where he is a southern lawyer representing a black american and there is of course one of my all-time favorites the one where he leaps into an actor performing the musical man of la mancha and gets to <laughs> sing all of the fun songs and draw the parents parallel there between him seeing holograms and being guided through something that nobody else sees and Don Quixote chasing windmills from his imaginary <laughs> uh, from his imagination. <laughs> Uh, I'm also looking at a lot of these little stills and you're right. I think it was contractual that Scott Bakula had to be shirtless at least once every episode. I think it was every season, shirtless every season and a, and he got to sing every season. He had to kiss a <laughs> girl every, uh, every episode. But that season two looks really strong. Season three looks really strong. If you were new to watching these, you, you don't have to watch the first season in order to get into what's going on. There's not a lot of pull back from episode to episode. And once you understand the premise, you can pick up any of these episodes at any time on Peacock, the app for NBC. Apparently. So we talked about the episode we watched. Well, let's talk about Sam and Elle a little bit okay. as characters. You mentioned before how uh, how creepy Al is. And I think, you, I think you're right. There were definitely a lot of course corrections along the way. Just a dirty old man. <laughs> you know, I, you know what parallels drew for me because of the, t- like our ages when this show was popular, I thought uh-huh. about Fred Savage and his little I- Italian friend in what show was that? Wonder Years? Is that the Wonder Years that he's? No, because he's got the nerdy friend in the Wonder Years. Isn't there right. another show? Okay, wait, hold on. I'm going to have to actually get this one. Fred Savage was in another show. Might not have been Fred Savage. Hold on. Oh, it's Doogie Howser. That's why. Oh. <laughs> Doogie Howser, MD. He's got his, his he, he's Doogie Howser, super smart and mature for his age because of his intelligence. And he's got the goofy knucklehead best friend. I think of Kirk Cameron's character in Growing Pains and yep. his boner. best friend, Boner. Right? Like, these are the parallels that I'm seeing and at the this is the show, time remember, frame. Theo's best friend, uh, cockroach. <laughs> cockroach, yes. And <laughs> Fresh Prince of Bel Air, right? DJ Jazzy Jeff. DJ Jazzy is the, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, he's the knucklehead best friend. So this is the time frame in which this show comes about. So seeing those opposites makes sense. But because this show was built more for adults than kids, L was creepy well beyond a boner or a cockroach character and they had to they had to reel that in by giving him a humanistic story yes and i mean he does and he does save the day a lot and it is kind of that trope of like you know swears like a sailor girl in every port like those kind of navy tropes that we have and that's his character and i think yeah i don't know if it was like oh this will be funny if he says the if he's this way but it's like no he's creepy he's 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 one of those guys that like you don't really like i'll hang out with that guy after work at the bar but i'm not inviting him to my house for he doesn't come over for thanksgiving or christmas well and sam calls him out in one of these episodes we watch too he's like is that all you ever think about yeah right like he calls him out on it so it yeah it's an interesting dichotomy between the two of them for sure right and i that's definitely on purpose and i think they also have i think those two actors have a lot of chemistry together right oh sure they're believable in every scene that they were put together not by choice but for this project and through yeah. that they become like the most important friends to each other one of the things about dr sam beckett being a time traveler is he is incredibly tragic this is a tragic tragic hero it says right from the get-go in like in the intro like hoping each leap that will be his leap home he never makes it no like the series it's... ends with him spoiler in... alert if you yeah. watch the last episode it's like it's it's all crazy and it wraps up a bunch of stuff and there's all this like explanation of what's happening and and it's it's fine but like the last thing you know how they put like words on the screen is like sam beckett continued to leap for the next 
33 years, he never made it home. Yeah. Boom, credits are all. Well, do you know what? Yeah, I also, just so you know, that happened because they filmed the final episode of that season, not knowing they were not going to be renewed for next season. So by the time it went to air, they had They're to slap on, on some sort of ending. So I wonder if he would have eventually found, if they had one more season and they knew they were going to wrap it up, if, would they have still wrapped it up that same way? I don't know. I don't know. I think it would be tempting for them to try to give him a happy ending because of all the hell he went through. But right. I'm glad he didn't. Like, I am sure. I think it's more courageous by the writers that they're like, no, this dude was trapped in time forever. And he died trying to help people make yeah. their lives better. Like, yeah. that's 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 awesome. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I would say like he's it's just totally it, it's very tragic. E- even not knowing, it's like he's he always is there, and he's always the only way he can get to the next thing is to set right what once went wrong, like go through the motions and try hard to fix something for someone else. And then we were talking about that chemistry. It's very believable that these two understand the commitment that they have, right? Like, yeah, Al yeah. can't take a sick day. Like he can't just right. decide. Oh, you know what? I'm not gonna. I'm not going to show up and help my buddy today right. because that might be it. And right. Sam would never make it home. You know, every, right. every leap was that hope of, okay, we'll do it this time. And then maybe the next time we'll get back to where we're supposed to be and we'll keep working on it. But it's very cool. And it's that relationship that they have as opposite as they are, I think is inspiring. Cause like I said, like they are very different, but they depend on each other and they get the job done every time. Yeah. And I think in terms of character, whether it's the way it was acted or the way it was written, I think some of the best moments of this episode are at the end and very beginning of every episode they right. had a built-in cliffhanger at the time you could not just go and stream a bunch of episodes back to back they weren't in syndication yet so you couldn't just wait for the commercial break and the next episode to start he leaped into something and it would or into someone else and it would usually end with him looking in the mirror because he knew he would see who it is that mm-hmm. he you know and he, that he leaped into and he, his tagline of old oh boy and it would freeze and end and start right where it left off the next episode a week later for those of you listening and have only watched television in the streaming era you had to wait a week and think about theorize about what's going to happen in the episode or open up the newspaper or the tv guide for a little description to see what's happening next but the way the beginnings of the episode was acted was always the most entertaining part as he's figuring out who he is not even why he's there but who he is and how to behave as that person now that's a commitment for sam beckett the character to Mm -hmm. say i'm going Going to treat each one of these lives as importantly as my own and figure out real quick what I'm supposed to be doing and how I say it and how I'm dressed and 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 I I think are the, is the most entertaining part of the whole show. Um, <clears throat> an absolute masterclass in how to make television at that time because not yeah. only was it week to week like we get stuff week to week now but it was also appointment viewing like you had to tune into CBS at seven o'clock to see the yes. show every yes. Thursday and so yes the cliffhanger brilliant because it yes. makes you want to see the next episode but what a master class in the cold open yes this is something that nobody else i don't think was doing you had to be there on time and see because in that yeah. first whatever it was 30 seconds before the theme song rang they were able to present everything you needed to know about yes. what was coming yes absolutely brilliant and we were the way it was written and the way it was acted allowed us to be part of the sleuthing, if you yes. will. Right. We had to do it right with them by looking at the visual cues and the audio cues and oh no, like, oh, he's wearing stockings. And that and that that was one of the episodes we watched. The MI episode, right? It starts mm-hmm. with him in heels and tights and in a dress, and he's like, Oh no, I'm a woman again. And he's it like struggling leads to walk. You down one path right. and then pulls it out. Yeah. Yeah. So we we're right there with him experiencing it. I, just very brilliantly done. And you're right, like a true masterclass of television at the time in insurance that your audience is going to tune in at the time where your ratings were determined on whether or not people were there at the start of the episode. Brilliant. What else? What else you got to say about Quantum Leap? Oh, I mean, we never talked about the spin kick. I mean, so many episodes he did this (laughs) judo spin kick. It was it was so funny. I think I've even played I, I'm sure I've played the like the quantum leap drinking game and one of like there's the you oh 100 like, we have the yes. oh boy the spin yes. kick yes. Uh, Al shirtless smacking the hand link like yes. all the little things that you know are going to be in every episode whether or not Al had a, some food or like a cigar or He's something always he always cigar, had something in his hand yeah banging on the thing 
but yeah, yeah that would be that would be the thing of like the ones the things that happen every episode and then there would be like the like take two drinks or like the chug when scott back in the shirtless or you know like he, he was singing himself, like, finish your drink he sings. Yeah, yes. drink. Yeah. just so fun. if you are of age listeners find yourself a quantum leap drinking game <laughs> go have at it with some of these episodes oh on peacock gosh. Let's do it. Let's do like an NSFW podcast behind the Patreon paywall. And it's our quantum leap drinking game podcast. I'm adding that to the to the editor's list because we have a couple there that we're going to put on Patreon. Yes. What, one other of them I'm going to write down quantum leap drinking game. One of the other ones is the um, Kanye West tweet or quote from 30 Rock uh brilliant uh, morgan tracy so yes that'll be a very fun game we got a couple things on that patreon list so what else do you have or or are we ready to wrap up i mean i love this show i could talk about it forever looking at it through the lens of right now for myself in the lens of feminism i'm really proud of what this show did Mm. in finding a way to get into middle america living rooms to see this man dressed as a woman in makeup acting like a woman and having to face women issues and and how women were treated and really just put it full front to people who may never have realized what experience is like for a black person in the south in the 50s for a a woman in the 60s being harassed by her boss like they just hit so many of these issues and did it in a manner that was digestible for pop culture and for america at the time you're right how does a show like this get made now i think that's why the the new version of it when did it come out not a couple not, years ago it didn't last oh i think and it's I think, still on i it? uh let's look it up 2022 and oh you're right it is still on and it's going to it's it's got four award nominations it's in its second season right now and probably delayed a little bit as well Maybe the next step is to go watch some of these newer ones and see. I'm not opposed to it. I didn't have time between the last episode and this episode to really dive into it. You know, it's the holidays season and stuff. I'm not opposed to it. But what I've seen is they break that fundamental rule. Like when I've seen the previews and stuff, it's like, oh, in this one, he's a cowboy. In this one, he's in ancient Egypt. In this one, he's in space. And it's like, I think it's a different show. This is interesting, actually, because I I just assumed they rebooted it. But it's connected. Let me read to you. Let me read to you this little two sentence thing. It says. Set 30 years after Dr. Sam Beckett stepped into the Quantum Leap Accelerator and vanished, follows a new team that must restart the project, hoping to understand the mysteries behind the machine and its creator. So him going back further thus makes sense because it's he's using Sam Beckett's technology. I'll give it a shot. <laughs> yeah, that's it's interesting. At least it's not just like we're going to remake Quantum Leap. Okay. It is, we uncovered this 30-year-old technology. Oh, look at this guy disappeared and never came back. Let's see what we can figure out about it. So him jumping around to more years of history makes a little bit of sense. A sequel to series Quantum Does Leap. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, well. I mean, it's size, it, but anything it makes yeah. sense if you wanted to. This new series centers around a new character, Dr. Ben Song, played by Raymond Lee. Dr. Song has ultimately been tasked with leading a new team to uncover the mysteries surrounding the original experiment and the now missing scientist, Dr. Sam Beckett. It's a continuum. It's a time continuum. So it'd be interesting. So maybe our next step is watching yeah. that and talking about it. Check it out. Although yeah, yeah. now that you have unlocked all the episodes of Quantum Leap on your Peacock subscription, you've got a you've got a great night ahead of you. Well, what one hundred percent now that we'll well, we'll get to it really soon with the nerdiest thing I did this week. It will be running in the background while I mini paint. <laughs> oh, perfect. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, I can't agree more, though, with your with your take. I think the ones where he was looking at the social commentary of not of not only race relations, which happened a few times, but women's experience, uh, women's experience in America were absolutely fantastic. There's an episode that you want to be sure to watch to see how it holds up. But I remember it being very powerful when I saw it decades ago was the episode Raped where he literally jumps into a rape victim while he's in the police station or she's in the police station making the reports and the way the police treat her and the way her family treats her and the victim blaming and those kinds of things. I think like for me coming up was teaching, right? And opened my eyes to different people's experiences. And I ultimately like final thoughts, that's where we go with my love of this show. It's not the sci-fi and it's not the acting, the acting, even though those are so great these 
shows and these topics were formative for me as a high school student and a young college student when I was watching all of these episodes and understanding what it was like for different people in different places at different times. And just coming yeah. out as a young man, having exposure to things where it wasn't just me worried about me and what I was doing right. all of the time. And so I I find that just absolutely formative for, for my personality even. And going forward through that, the entire thing theme of the show being when you're doing good, when you're helping others, it may not be because you're going to change the course of history in any big way, but everything you do affects the people around you. And wouldn't you want to make sure that you and all of those other lives that you touch have the best experience possible? That is kind of the crux of what I think the magic of this show is, is every little thing we do affects the lives of the people around us. And I think it's brilliant. My angle for it was having watched episodes here and there when it was live uh, and my parents were watching it, allowed me to explore history in a way that felt safer mm -hmm. and definitely more interesting than opening an encyclopedia or our history textbooks. 100%. It gave some, because it hit on Vietnam so much, because it hit on things that had just happened a couple decades prior to us being adolescents, um, it gave connection for me in, in my learning in school. Things are lessons that I learned that just connected for me when we'd open that page and talk about civil rights or we opened that page and talked about the military and learned about this. There were connections to this show and the way they approached history was was pretty cool. Quantum leap, man. <laughs> Scott Bakula. What is the nerdiest thing you did this week? At the time of our recording, we just had the week off around Thanksgiving. And me and my partner went up to Oregon, spent time with my stepkids. We brought a bunch of board games with us and we played board games almost every night. It was nice. really, really fun. My board game stats app got loaded <laughs> when, uh, when we were up there and just hanging out in Oregon. And I will say, I mean, bring up mini painting coincidentally mm -hmm. i mini painted for the first time since i moved and even like i don't know the last two months i was in santa barbara i didn't paint at all because things were in a box and even though i kept that sure. box at yeah. the apartment yeah. i mean i kept the box there like oh, i'm gonna get bored i'm gonna be by myself in the apartment while well, sarah's unpacking at the new house let me i just never took them out all that time that i was yeah. there so and then i set everything up in here and hadn't painted until this week so i finally got started finishing final girl series two Ooh. and getting all those characters ready so i can play it mini painting and board gaming that's great yeah. we also took a little trip at the end of november and i packed a bunch of board games a stack I had it organized in the car, like, nope, that's where the big stack of board games is going to go because <laughs> it gets dark early and we're going to be, you know, yeah. where it's cold and stuff. Andrew got so sick. Andrew was sick the oh, entire no. trip, just absolutely glassy eyed, laying in bed oh. while we went out and did all of the fun stuff. He was stuck there and just didn't feel like doing anything. So we didn't play any of those games. Oh, poor Andrew. Nerdiest thing I did this week. Check this out. What on earth? Look at that. It's a treehouse. I've seen it's you make something. Like I've been doing a bunch of stuff from this company here. They are yeah. called Fantasy Designs. And this was a Kickstarter I backed as far as 3D print files. And they have this super cool one with uh, tree really houses and forests and this kind of stuff that I've been doing. It's been really, it's been really fun. So I've got these big trees with platforms and ladders and rope bridges and stuff and these kinds of tree houses and everything. And it's been, it's been really, uh, it's been really fun to do. And I just wanted to kind of shout out that company, Fantasy Designs, because they've actually moved on from the setting or, or like the set pieces, the terrain pieces mm -hmm, to, mm -hmm. to 3D print into these incredible like storage boxes. So oh. we'll probably include it in the newsletter or maybe somewhere else. I somewhere else I, I did link the uh the Kickstarter page there and you'll see, gosh, how to even describe it. It's modular 3D printed pieces that you assemble into one. Oh. 
fun. Oh, look at that. They have like a shelf, like a like a display shelf that you can make and you can run LED lights through it and put in shelves and all this stuff, as well as carrying cases, like building actual miniature storage carrying cases with handles and latches and all kinds of stuff on it. And I think that's just so cool. <laughs> I really like this modular display case that you can hang up and put stuff in and get them lit up. Oh, those are really cool. So Isn't they, that interesting? They're not selling the thing. They're selling the files for you to print right. and make at home. So interesting. That's right. smart. Which, which actually makes it quite in, like incredibly cost efficient. Like to buy something that looks like that already made and stuff would be a lot more than you know, the 20 bucks of plastic it's going to take to <laughs> to print it out. And, and plus you do it yourself, which is always fun and as you, well. And you can paint to your decor instead of hoping that you find something that matches your room. Wow. And you that's can do any point. size. Yeah, that's pretty phenomenal. And we'll yeah, definitely and put right. it in the you newsletter. Just toggle it up and down like, oh, I want it to be, I actually need mine to be this depth. So I'll just right. increase it by 20% in the program and then away yeah. we go. So that's I really just thought- cool. And what a pivot, right? You think about like that company started out with, you know, something like, like the tree house, like fantasy tree house and a thing. It's mm-hmm. like very artistic and kind of whimsical and stuff. And then to kind of turn the corner and be like, Oh, you know what else is cool for like function? Let's make yes. a very straight ahead thing for our we'll audience. We'll make something specifically showing. for you instead of going to Ikea and trying to hack a shelf yes. to make it what you want. Yeah. That's really smart. Yeah. So smart way fantasy to get designs, there. I think is just super cool. I've been having a lot of fun with their product and I feel like people should be aware of them if that's something that they thought was cool too. Next episode, we are ringing in another new year. And with that comes our new nerd goals. 24 for 2024. And we'll also look at our 23 goals and see how that went. Maybe we shouldn't do that part. (laughs) (laughs) Remember to subscribe, share, and give us that five-star rating wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on social media platforms at Nerd Best Friends, or send a message by writing to podcasts at nerdbestfriends.com. Annalise, it has been an absolute joy, not only watching Quantum Leap, but thinking about Quantum Leap (laughs) and discussing Quantum Leap with you. And Uh, I hope we hear from our audience about how much they love the show, or maybe you think about wanting to give the show a chance. Or Um, the new one a chance. Yeah. Or the new one. Maybe maybe we could get a recommendation or a, what's the opposite of a recommendation? A stay away from. (laughs) Oh, yeah. There you go. Ooh, that's a good one. What's the opposite? What is the opposite of recommendation? Hey Siri, what's the opposite of recommendation? Discouragement, disapproval, dissuasion, censure. Yeah, dis- I like dissuasion. Yes. You either give us a recommendation or a dissuasion from the show. Bam. Well, find us on Patreon, everyone. Happy holidays. Yeah, happy holidays. We'll see you in the new year. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. Oh, man, Um, we are all over the place. Yeah, we are. (laughs) Stop recording. Oh, yeah, that's my job.